and welcome to our first episode, Tales from the Teacher's Lounge. We're here to talk about teaching and the art of improv. I'm super excited. I couldn't be more excited about our first guest, Paul Valancourt. Paul actually uh, was with me when I launched Ad Lib Theater officially a few years back, and um, I'm just really excited that he's here again to help launch this podcast. This interview took place over Skype, and a few times, both of our internet connections were a little weird and wonky. So the first few minutes sound one way, and then the rest of the interview sounds another way. But I still think you will totally get everything you need out of it. There's lots of great information, lots of great tips. Uh, It's a great way to hear Paul and his lens on teaching and how how he takes on the improv world. For those of you who have yet to meet Paul, he's the co-founder of iOS out in Los Angeles. He has been teaching and performing improv close to 30 years. He has appeared all over the country, including such notable venues as HBO's Comedy Arts Festival in Aspen, Chicago's I.O., where he studied with the immortal Del Close, New York's UCB Theater, and Austin's Out of Bounds Festival, to name a few. Paul has also had success as a writer and producer, co-creating and serving as supervising writer for the MTV hit The Blame Game, as well as lending his writing and producing talents to a score of other shows for MTV, VH1, USA, Oxygen, Bravo, and AMC. He published his first book about improv called The Triangle of the Scene, which is available on iBooks and Amazon Kindle, and for the past year and a half has been producing a weekly series of videos called Improv Tips, which are available on his YouTube channel, PV Improv. I'm going to go ahead and stop talking. I hope you enjoy our first episode. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Paul Valencourt. So, hey, Paul, how are you? Good, Lauren. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you uh, for taking your time to do this. I appreciate it very much. My pleasure, absolutely. Um, That's about improv, my favorite thing. Right. Me too. So hopefully we won't make it a three-hour conversation. Right. Uh, <laughs> who knows? Let's just jump into um, how long have you been teaching now? Um, that's a great question. I started teaching um, probably, I mean, informally, like when I was in college, because we were all sort of teaching each other, you know what I'm saying? Like the previous generation would teach the next generation. So, um, <clears throat> so informally, you know, almost 30 years, and then formally – just a couple of few years later than that, I started teaching in Chicago. Um, uh, trying to think of what year it was, like maybe I've been here 20 years. So maybe 17, 18 years, uh, no, um, like 27 years, something like that. Okay. So you said you started in college informally, which actually, um, brings to the next question of like why or how you came into teaching. Right. Well, well in college, as, as I said, it's, um, it was, it's, you know, it's a regular college improv group sort of thing. At the time, there wasn't like now college improv groups can sort of farm out some of that stuff to, you know, improvising teachers who who travel and stuff like that. But at the time, all we had was just each other and sort of a list of games that we knew and stuff. We were mostly a short form troupe, although some long form, mostly short form. And we would sort of whoever had been there the longest would teach like the next group of people. And, you know, so there was an artistic director and that would be the person who'd be sort of like in charge of the instruction or whatever. And, um, in my college, university of Maryland college park in my improv group, erasable Inc. shout out. Um, we did, uh, we didn't have like, uh, auditions per se. We like had workshops and we would offer these free workshops and people would come in and they would kind of like, we would teach them kind of what we knew, you know, which looking back was not a ton, but it was enough to sort of get by. And, and then if people sort of stood out, we would sort of invite them to rehearsals and stuff and have, a, that was kind of our, our audition. So starting then that was sort of like the beginning. So initially I got into it as sort of out of necessity, but then formally when I got to Chicago, I was, um, I was, uh, you know, at, at IO in Chicago and, uh, your first, generally your first sort of teaching opportunity was to be a coach. So, um, a couple of people, um, Amy and Martin, uh, approached me about coaching their team. And I, uh, and that was like my first coaching opportunity. I've been at IO for maybe a year or so. So I was like a little bit ahead of them. So when Sharna, uh, so you sat in with level one Sharna and then she decided, okay, great. You're ready to teach. Um, what class did she have you off and running to where you provided a curriculum and what kind of training, if any? 
Yes. Um, well, you sort of make it sound actually more formal than it was. It was kind of all kind of like just one thing would sort of morph into another. It was very loosey-goosey back in the days. Um, but I started coaching, and then I was um, uh, sort of working on a show with Matt Besser called The Real Real World. And um, and then from there, kind of when he, when he moved on, I just sort of inherited that class. I sort of slipped into that class. I think he may have recommended me for it or something. And so I sort of just ended up teaching that class. Uh, but I didn't really have a curriculum per se. I just kind of taught the class that he had taught to us, really. It's kind of really, it was cra- it's crazy now that I think about it. But back in the day, it was very like word of mouth, very sort of like oral tradition. So I remembered what he had taught us, and so I just taught that back to the next group that I that I taught, like a few sessions later, because I'd been doing the movie pretty pretty consistently by then, and um, and the deconstruction sort of off and on, but uh, but yeah, I think sort of also sort of I'm trying to remember the exact sort of mechanism of it, but I think it also at the same time I started sitting in with the family, so I sort of had a little bit of um, experience sort of in Sharda's eyes. She invited me to sit in with the family when when they needed a, a, a sub. And so I kind of had that going for me too. And sort of between coaching and sitting with the family and sort of, um, I think Matt Besser's recommendation, I ended up in that, uh, teaching that level three class. It was level three at the time, that level three class. Okay. Uh, so let's fast forward a little bit because um, for those of you who didn't even either listen to the introduction or know who you are, you then took IO out to Los Angeles. So, I did. Right. Mm-hmm. So when you did that, were you also um, the only teacher? Were you bringing some teachers with you at the time? And then, so curriculum-wise, how was that happening for you? Because there's a lot of people, I think, these days who are starting their own theaters, and they're, you know, just essentially copying either what they learned. Um, so, and that's essentially you were, you started a theater from the ground up. So I'm sure listeners out there would like to hear how that happened. I uh, when I opened the IO out here, I had a lesson plan that Sharna had given me. But I say lesson plan very sort of charitably because it was not any elaborate thing. It was a few sketched out ideas and stuff, and and so I kind of like started with that, and you know just started filling in the blanks of stuff that um, worked for me and stuff that didn't work for me, and you know there's still there's. I, I still teach uh, scenes with secret wants, and I still teach conflict scenes, which were on that very first curriculum. Um, I teach ad game that was on that very first curriculum. But aside from that, I, I kind of have found a bunch of other things that I think work for me. Um, I think one of the things that was on there was like six-sided wear that I never was a fan of doing. And I have a hard time like teaching exercises that I don't like doing because I feel like a hypocrite, you know. Um, and so I, I try to teach ones that sort of get those same lessons across, but in a way that I think is more um, that's more palatable for me. Like if I was a student, I would like that exercise more than let's say another one or whatever. Um, and then I at first I was the only teacher. So for the first um, level one, oddly enough, when we started, we had three level one classes the first round. And so I was teaching two classes, like basically back to back on Saturday. And then one class on Sunday. So I would teach like six hours basically straight on Saturday. I did not even think to have a half an hour break in between the classes. So the, the one class would be clearing out, the other class would be c- coming in. And while they were settling, I would like run across the street to McDonald's and grab a hamburger and eat it as I was running back across the street to class. And, um, and, and, then, one, and then one on Sunday. That was my life day, only three hours on Sunday. Once the I.O. was kind of up and running, a ton of – like IO expatriates who were in, in Los Angeles came out of the woodwork. And, and suddenly the, you know, we were doing these Armandos that nowadays you would think like were totally stacked. Like it was like Dave Keckner was one of the first people to appear. And then Steve Carell was there some and, and a bunch of other guys were just like coming out of the woodwork to do these shows. And it was uh, it was super fun. And so from those people, we started drawing, you know, the next generation or the next bunch of teachers here in L.A. So at first it was me, then it was me and Pete Gardner, and then it was and then it sort of grew from there. And I wrote, I wrote sorry, sort of back to your curriculum idea. Once I had 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 taught level one a few times, um, I started to um, I basically wrote a whole curriculum, like for like six levels, kind of what I thought 
it should be um, just as a guideline. And that's kind of what we used at first. And then, uh, you know, it was sort of like the first curriculum that was given to me. It was sort of like a guideline, and people used what they thought worked, and then they would replace exercises and stuff. But at least at the time, at the moment, we had sort of like goals and sort of a, a direction that we were moving in. When you're looking to create a class, what does that kind of look like for you? Sure. Um, I start doing it the same way every time, which is in general – um, we come in and I say the same things every time I say, does anyone have any questions? Because there's any old business, I want to sort of wrap that up. Or if there's any questions lingering, I want to answer those questions from last time or from whatever. Then I ask if anyone saw any shows. I like to talk about shows because I think it's really important for the students to see, um, see what we're working on in action. You know, and I always tell them it's important to see shows that are, uh, that are really good and some shows that maybe aren't as good. Teams have been doing it for a long time. And teams have been doing it for a short time because you get to see all different kinds of, of uh, angles on the work. And when you see a team that's been doing it for like, um, you see like a, a King Ten or like a Beer Shark Mike that's been at it for years and years. Sometimes it's just overwhelming. You're like, oh my gosh, that's so fun, but I don't have no idea how that how that works. But if you see a team that's newer or maybe isn't quite as polished, you get to see some of the seams of the work. And in some ways, I think that's more informative for students um, because they say, oh, gosh, look, they, they said no there, and that kind of stopped the scene, but then they said, yes, they fixed it like this, you know? And I think that's, uh, in a lot of ways, I think that can be more helpful for students even than seeing a, a really polished show. A, a, a polished show is very aspirational, but I think that a, that a sort of a, maybe a little bit more unpolished show is a little bit more informative. Um, and so I ask if anyone's on any shows, and then I, I sort of tell them what my agenda is for the night. And I uh, basically we do warm-ups um, first, and I do some of the same warm-ups every week, and then I'll add sort of class-specific warm-ups if we're working on certain things. Like when we do uh, day three of level one, when we do environment, I do five things, and I do an exercise, you are, uh, yeah, that's why I have this which is sort of that kind of thing. So I'll do warm-ups, and then if I have a drill, I'll do a drill, and then I'll sort of get into the, the exercises that I want to cover for the night. And, uh, and that's my formula. So I was going to say, you, so you're taking a look at what you'd like to accomplish that night. Uh, I mean, because there's probably the what you want to accomplish as a whole, like we were saying with the, over, the, the big goal, like if we're looking at level yeah. one, and then what each class has. And then it sounds to me like the way you prepare is also by making sure that your exercises tie back to the goals and objectives you have for that class. Yes, for sure. I mean, I think that in, in level one, especially, um, I have a very uh, clear sort of stepping stone approach of what I want to accomplish each class, um, kind of what I sort of by necessity. So I think sort of like day one, it's sort of like, is sort of like at, like yes and, and hyper acceptance, and the triangle of the scene, like all the basic things that we need to even move forward at all. And then day two, we talk about secret wands and, and conflict scenes, these skills that we're going to need to move forward at all. And then day three, we need, you know, we need the environment. Well, day three is environment. And then it sort of builds like day on day like that. Um, but I think that sort of the, the, my sort of concept of the class and the way that it seems to work the best for me is like I have one central message for the whole seven weeks that I keep coming back to. And every class kind of sort of fits, uh, sort of is another angle on that idea over and over and over again. Um, and I think that's, that's the way the students understand it in a more holistic sort of way. So the, so the lessons aren't, aren't disconnected. They're all, all connected by the central theme, the central one lesson I'm trying to get through, and these are all different lessons and different exercises to help them sort of round out that idea. That probably also helps you then monitor uh, a student's progress to see if they're, yeah. they're hitting certain goals and objectives as well. Uh, are you, so are you using any metrics, or are you just, because you know your curriculum so well, kind of have, like, I know what the student needs to be hitting? Are you required to fill anything out? No. I mean, at the end, you know, we sort of uh, sort of evaluate the students, but it's not like a, not like a report card per se, you know, it's not like, oh, their handwriting is great. They play well with others, whatever. It's, it's really sort of, um, <laughs> it's kind of subjective, but you kind of know, here's, here's kind of what I want them to be able to do. I want them to be able 
able to do a good relationship-based, game-driven, two-person scene. And if you, for me, I have a super clear idea of what that is and how that is supposed to work. So I can judge, I guess, sort of how closely are they sort of accomplishing that goal or how well are they accomplishing that goal. You know, and I think sort of because I'm super clear on what it is that I want and how it, how it is that I want them to do it, it's really clear to me if they're accomplishing it or not. You know, I feel like before I sort of nailed down on the triangle of the scene, it was a little bit harder for me to sort of judge or sort of tell how people were doing because they would sort of go up and down like they would catch lightning in a bottle and then they would totally, you know, screw up and, and there'd just be a giant fight and then it would be kind of like halfway good and halfway that. But if you have like a, an objective idea, like for me, it's the triangle of the scene. I know that this is how, this is the sort of the, the system or the method that I want them to do. So I can judge them on that each scene, every scene. It, Cause I feel like giving notes about a specific scene is, is a waste of time because they're never going to do that scene again. So it's gotta be notes or sort of teachable moments that are more universal. You know, because if you're just giving notes about specific scenes, well, no, specific scene, blah, 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 because, of the, you know, so what? They're, they're never going to do that scene again. Right. It doesn't help them at all. But if you can say, well, you see how in this scene you did X, Y, Z? Well, if you do X, Y, X in the future, it'll change the scene or sort of, you know, it's sort of a more te okay. teachable moment. So you've been doing that. Um, I, I'm, well, I guess I'll just ask you, have you ever had to not pass a student? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, do you remember the first time you had to not pass a student? The first time? No, I don't necessarily remember the first time. I haven't done it a ton. I haven't done it a ton because I teach, I teach level one, and our, our sort of, you know, expectations for level one are pretty simple. But I will say that um, pretty universally, the students who have, I have held back, to repeat, um, uh, have been, I don't know if grateful is the right word, but they, but they understand. And I think that sort of in the long run, they have benefited from repeating because they just weren't getting the basics of it. Like if you're not getting yes and, if you're not getting giving out information about your partner, if you're not getting playing the relationship, you don't, you may want to move ahead. You may think you want to move ahead, but you are going to drown in level two and three and so and so. So it, really you don't, you know what I'm saying? You, as I tell my students, look, I want everyone to move forward, but I want everyone to succeed when they move forward. I don't want you to just move forward and then just drown in level two. I want you to go into level two and kill it and really get after it, you know? And that means that you need to have the basics. And sometimes that's the only reason I've ever held anyone back really is because of that. I assume uh, that is, that conversation, though, is not coming like the week they're not getting moved forward. So you probably see it coming. What's that conversation like? How are you handling that with your students? Right. A lot of, well, there's, there's, two, there's, two kinds of, there's two kinds of things that happen. One is a student's just not getting it. They know they're not going to get it. And kind of in, there's a part of them that doesn't just want to get it, you know? So they kind of like self-select and they're kind of like, I'm not really going to move on to level two. And you're like, okay, that's fine. It's because it's, it's not for everybody. That's, that's fine. And I totally get that. You, you just wanted to come in and check it out. And hopefully you had fun and it was a good experience. And you know that it's not for you. Or maybe this, this style isn't for you. And I think that's a great, that's really, I admire that sort of self-knowledge because I think that we can get on a track of something and just feel like I've got to get all the way through this thing, no matter what, even if it's the opposite of what I need. Um, or what's good for me. Um, so, that, so that happens a lot. Not a lot, but that happens some in those kind of situations. And the other situation is, is I try to, if I feel like someone's really not getting it, like week five, uh, I try to email them and say, hey, uh, if I, I'm sure I've talked to them. I try, I try to give notes and talk to them, and sometimes I'll, I'll hold them back and talk to them after class. But, um, but I talk to people after class for a variety of reasons, but sometimes I'll, I'll um, hold them after class and just say, how's it going, and kind of check in with them or give them a little specific private feedback. Um, but if I really feel like they're not getting it and they're in danger of not passing, week five, I'll send them an email and I'll say, look, here's what I'm seeing in your work. Here's what I need to see to pass you on to level two. And I sort of remind them, you know, I, I want everyone to pass on, but I want everyone to succeed when they pass on. And so I try to sort of, you know, you know, pull them into that conversation so we can 
talk about that because you know, I, like I said, I, I I want them to do well. I want everyone to fall in love with improv and and, and and do great things with it and just do it all the time and all that kind of stuff. But but that means that you know, and I I, I tell my students that the the I think that everyone has a sticking place with the word. Some people's level one, some people's level two, three, four, whatever. Sometimes it's when you get on your first team and you're banging your head against the wall and that there's everyone has their little sticking point with it. And it's just like, how do I, how do I get through that? These days, uh, I feel like at least for those who have taken workshops with you and classes with you, the feedback I'm always hearing is about the presence you have the moment you step in and start teaching. Cause for those of you, people, maybe you don't know, you're already, you're already tall and you're kind of a big guy and you have a ton of energy that you bring in. Yeah. Um, but that's something I, yeah. I think that you also, like, you've earned the gravitas that comes into the classroom. But, you know, maybe in the earlier days and whatnot, what sort of, like, and you probably are using them today, it's just maybe in a different way, but the type of classroom management skills are you employing? Because at the end of the day, these are adult learners. They have their own challenges, um, and you're the teacher. Right. Right. I think that um, I tell my students, right off the bat, like, look, there's a couple of things you need to know about me. One, I like it cold in class. Two, I talk really fast. So if you have questions, ask them. I'll answer questions, like, all day long so the cows come home. But I, I have a ton of stuff. I love improv. I can't wait to tell you everything that I want to tell you about improv. And I think that, I, I mean, I think that sort of people just can tell that I really love improv and I really want to tell them about it. I really want to talk about it at the beginning of level one, first day, at the beginning of all my classes, really, first day, I sort of hear a little bit about everyone's story, and I get to tell them a little bit about my story, what I, how I fell in love with improv, and, and, and how I just can't wait to tell them about it, and, and I think that sort of people can tell my sincerity that I really want, it's not just a job for me, it's like really, as I say on the first day, like when I saw my first improv show, it was like a calling to the priesthood, it was like super clear to me, like this, this is what I want to do, and so that enthusiasm has not waned at all. And I, I always want to get, I mean, I, I, I love teaching and uh, communicating that to people and sort of ha helping other people fall in love with improv. So it's, you know, I, I think that's my number one thing is, is, is enthusiasm. And then past that, it's really just, you know, I, I just set clear rules and expectations at the top. Don't text during class. And just pay attention when, when, when whoever's on stage is not just, you're not just in class when you're on stage, you're in class when you're in the audience too, because you can learn a ton from what other people are doing in class. Just like I said before, that especially when people are struggling, when they're just first learning, because you get to see like, oh, they mean, that, that's what I would do and that didn't work, or that's what I would do and that did work, you know, so you get to kind of really see, you're watching like a little bit of a show in class, you know, it's, you get to see kind of the, the decisions that people make and how that works or doesn't work for them. So you know, I think that's, I think that's super, um, I think that's super helpful. And, um, and I just try to sort of say clear expectations of, of, of what I want from the students at, at the top of class. And, and, and aside from that, in general, like no one, no one's there because they're forced to be like, I talked to the interview and I taught like SAT preparation. There's a ton of people who were there who didn't want to be there because their mom and dad had forced them to be there or whatever. So I try to, keep it light. I try to keep it moving. I try to get everyone up at least three times per class. You know, the class is like three and a half hours. So you get up like at least once per hour, um, hopefully more than that, even counting warm ups and stuff, you know? So I try to keep it, I try to keep it moving and, and that kind of thing. I mean, that's, that's really sort of my biggest thing. I mean, you know, you taking class with me, you know, I move at a pretty quick right. clip, you know, I don't rush. I don't, but I also don't just, I don't, do, I try to give less notes than the length of the scene. Like if the scene was two minutes, I try not to give five minutes of notes. You know what I'm saying? Like I try to cut to the most important, to the most important things and, and get those out there. Improv is always a journey. I think the teaching, teaching is also a journey and it, and it grows and spurts just like we do with our improv and whatnot. So what do you do to one, keep your passion for the teaching and to continue to hone and build your own skills as a teacher? I don't, I honestly don't have a problem keeping my passion for teaching because I love improv so much. And when I see students like come in, I especially love uh, to teach, maybe I'm selfish in this, but I love to teach level one and level three, which at IOS is intro to scene work and intro to Harold. Because for me, I, I can see students grow from the beginning of a class to three and a half hours later, the end of that class, I can see them get better. I can see them struggle with something. And that, to me, is super exciting, you know. 
that kind of really keeps me going is, is that sort of like immediate feedback where I get to see them improve real time. Um, so that, that keeps me really passionate about it. And I, of course, I just love improv. I, I still do shows, so I still have, you know, my hand in it sort of doing that. So that's really, that sort of keeps me involved in it. So I'm getting the sort of the, the boots on the ground sort of experience and adrenaline head of doing shows fairly regularly. Um, and in terms of like, how do I keep myself uh, motivated? I, you know, I've been doing improv tips on YouTube for a while. So I get to mix with other teachers and hear their sort of specific uh, improv tips, which is really fun. And, uh, and that, that really helps me improve. And then also sort of doing the improv tips. I have to sort of try to nail down my thoughts or my feelings about improv into like discrete chunks of ideas, you know? So I think because improv is so amorphous in some ways, it's easy to get to sort of talk all around the moon about it and not really get down to here is the thing that I think about, you know, and, and doing improv tests has been really helpful in that because I sort of need to nail it down. Like, here's the one idea I'm going to say about this thing. Boom, that's it. Uh, in one minute or two minutes. Um, I also just see it, improv as my lens on the world, and I see everything through the lens of improv. So when I'm, like, reading a book about, you know, reading a book by Tim Ferriss about how to improve learning, I'm thinking about, oh, my gosh, how could I use that in – in, um, in, in teaching improv, or if I'm, you know, watching a TED talk about something, I think, oh gosh, how can I use that in teaching improv? Like I'm always, I'm always thinking about improv. That's how I sort of see things. That's how I interact with the world is through the lens <clears throat> of improv. Like, like a lot of people sort of have their, have their religion. They see everything is like through the lens of the Bible or Jesus or whatever. For me, it's improv. Like that's my lens on the world. And I kind of like see things through that. And so I think that's, I think I'm always trying to sort of do better and, and, communicate more clearly and sort of get new new things to bring them and new ideas and different ways to teach to to better get my point across right writing the book was a super writing my book was a super helpful experience because like again i just sort of really really think it out and really sort of nail down what do i think about this how do i want to communicate this because i can't like talk and talk and talk like i do in class or whatever as i said i don't try i try not to do that but you, you can't just sort of like say something and then answer a question about it, say something, answer a question about it, you have to like really, or I had to really, really crystallize my ideas into the clearest version of this exercise, the clearest version of this explanation that could stand on its own without me behind it, propping it up, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, do you, do your students uh, fill out evaluations and surveys of you? Yeah, I they do, uh-huh. Okay. So, uh, have you ever had an evaluation survey come back and you were surprised by what, what was said? Yeah, sure. All the time. Cause it's like, you, I mean, you think you sort of know, you know, you think you know what, what people's experiences are, but then you don't, or they say, they say the, the, the craziest thing is <laughs> the hardest thing to swallow is when someone gives you a survey that you think is patently false. That is like I wish you would have been I wish you would have been more accessible or whatever you know and I'm like <laughs> right emails every single week every single email says please email me if you have any questions I say hey I'm gonna stick around for a few minutes after class if anyone has any questions I take them aside I took this person specifically aside to to have a one on one interaction with them and then they write on their assessment I wish you had been more accessible which I, I guess you right. know, to their house and tuck them in at night I'm not sure what what they want out of that thing you know that's that's harder that's hard to that's hard to swallow but i think what what i think is very helpful is kind of their their um their take on like what is their favorite exercise and what is their least favorite exercise that that's really important to me that's really important to know that um uh and kind of and sort of feedback associated with that i think is really is really important um when i was i just taught uh, sort of, I went out of state to teach, and I taught a series of workshops. And one of the feedbacks I got from that was that it, by the end, I taught I taught five workshops, and by the end, it was the, they were exhausted, and they were like saying, "Oh, it's too much. It was exhausting." So, so that's that's like okay. So for the future, I'll try to keep in mind to not. I'll work with the the people who are putting on the workshops to maybe not stack them as much, because people felt like it was just exhausting by the end they had a hard time sort of like getting stuff out of the class because they felt like we had done so many and so much over so many days you know right um 
Yeah, so I think, but I, I do, I do take their feedback into account, especially at the beginning. I think, and um, I saw students writing, "Oh, he's he's giving more notes than how long the scene was," you know. So that idea has really stuck with me clearly because I just said that earlier. Um, so I try to really sort of take that into account and you know do more than talk. Like I think that's super important. I think that as you become, <laughs> you know, as as you teach more, I think generally you should kind of move in that direction of like do more and talk less because you should kind of know your thoughts more. You shouldn't have to like talk out the idea or talk out the note. You should know here's the note I want to get. And then let's get back to doing. Let's do some more. You know? Right. Um, unless unless there's a specific sort of little lecturette that I need to give, which is day one, I have to communicate a lot of information. So I talk a bunch on day one, just sort of set the stage for what we're doing. But then past that, I set up the exercise and then I try to get, let's do it. Let's get down to doing it because doing it is learning it. You know, talking about it is not doing it. Right. I consider both post emails part of using materials for class. So in addition to the post uh, post class emails, what other materials are you using in class that you found useful for your students? Great. Um, I don't really, um, I sort of recommend some books during the class as I'm teaching. So I'll sort of reference books and recommend some books. Um, I'll recommend podcasts that I, that I like, that I listen to. Um, I, for level three, I um, reference this, uh, this King Ken show about Buffalo, because I think it's a good example of a of an organic opening. I sort of use that as a reference point in my class. I send them links to videos from improv tips that, that are applicable to our class. I want to run through some specific scenarios, but before I do that, before I do that, so for um, somebody who's like new to teaching, um, what, where, do you have any like materials that you were like, oh, that really helped with my teaching or taking me to think about teaching in a different way? Um, I don't really have any materials or anything. I do have a sort of a philosophy that I've sort of been sort of cultivating lately because this kind of question has come up a lot lately because people are starting to coach or starting to teach and they're asking, like, what, do you, what advice do you have or whatever? So for me, I think the thing, it's not a material per se, it's just a thought, and that is that I think to, to be a good or effective coach or teacher, I think the first thing you need to do is figure out what is it that you believe about improv specifically. Like, once you know that, it's going to be much easier. And it took me years to figure out that and to figure out what that was for me. But once I figured that out, I feel like I've just been able to, where where before I was kind of trying to figure it out with them each each new lesson and each new scene was like, was like figuring it out. And I had sort of a, a feeling of, of what I wanted to be and a feeling of kind of what I wanted them to do or do different. But once I knew exactly what I believed about improv, it, giving notes and watching scenes became a lot more effective, I think, for me. You know, And for me, that was the triangle of the scene. Once I sort of nailed down that idea for me, then, then it was a lot easier to communicate that to the students and, and – and they sort of knew exactly what I expected, and they knew, um, you know, when the scene was over, I would say, "How do you think you did?" And they and they can tell, "Oh, I didn't give them a big playable gift, or I, I didn't, I had my gift, but I didn't know how to play it, or whatever." And then we can have more meaningful discussions rather than before I had that in place. I would say, "Well, how how, how did it go?" And they're like, oh, "I'm pretty good, I guess." And I would say, "Yeah, yeah, it did go pretty good." Maybe, maybe I don't know if you could whatever heighten the relationship somehow. You know, say like these vague notes. I didn't have a specific sort of. I mean, I think I help students. I think I help move them forward, but not with the same clarity that I do. I hope not with the same clarity that I do nowadays. I feel much more confident about it, um, and I feel like oh, clearly this is it, and clearly this is the message that I want to get across, and clearly this is where the scene like succeeded or failed. And clearly, this is why, you know, but that's because of what I believe about improv. Right. So if the advice is figure out what you believe about improv, um, how does that person go about really doing that? Taking a look at how their style of play or how they are currently teaching or about to get ready to teach or... 
great question because it's like it's sort of like how where's your artistic voice come from is sort of a little bit of that same idea you know and I think that sort of it, going back to my own experience of teaching that level three class about the movie and the deconstruction, you know, I feel like for the first, you know, as we're learning, we're like sort of filling a cup. We sort of fill it with ideas and fill, fill it with sayings and fill it with like pithy little comments or observations or whatever. We fill it, fill it, fill it. And then the, our first year or so of teaching is just sort of pulling ideas out of that cup that, that, that apply to this situation. You know what I'm saying? We are sort of in, in a very real way, I think the amalgamation of all the teachers that we've had and all the sort of play that we've done, you know, we're sort of like, um, I quote, I quote Dell a ton, or I quote Sharna a ton, or I quote, you know, teachers that, that, that have been meaningful to me in class because they have things that are applicable to, to the situation. But along the way, I've also sort of figured out my take on it. So I have my own original things to say about it, you know? So I think that sort of, um, I think that it's, it's a little bit of a process. Like one is like, how do I play? What do I really believe about, about playing? Do I really believe that it's the premise? Do I really believe it's the game? Do I really believe it's the relationship? Like once I figure that part out, then I sort of build around that. But in terms of like how to communicate that, I think it's going to be sort of a, uh, an amalgam of all the teachers that, that you've had. And then I think it's going to be your own specific voice or take on it, you know? Um, I think I think we have to come to that o- o- over some time. You know, I think that's the that's the tricky part. You don't just want to reiterate, but by the same token, you know, if something works for you or worked for you as a student, why not? Right. You know, Dell used to say, I'll uh, quote Dell in this particular situation. Dell used to say, "You call it plagiarism, I call it research." <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> you know, and I think that's I think beginning of teaching you sort of you know what what worked for me as a student and I try to sort of replicate that and then and then I try to come up with my own thing I think sometimes people put the cart before the horse and they're like I'm going to teach and I'm going to teach a totally new thing I've just started teaching and I'm going to totally reinvent the the wheel you know it's like hey man hey we've got wheels we've got a wheel that works pretty good you know try out this wheel for a little bit you know I'm not trying to keep anybody down or keep someone from like you know, sort of following their, their passion or whatever. But I think that, um, I think that, you know, it's, you, I think that really as teachers, I think we stand on the shoulders of our own teachers. You know, I don't think that we sort of come into being fully formed and like, oh my gosh, or whatever. We, we sort of, we stand on the shoulders of the teachers that we had, you know, because I know that like Matt Besser was a big influence on me and Ali and Sharna and Dell, of course, and, you know, Noah Gregoropoulos and a lot of these guys are, are, they say things or, you know, or I say things that, that I know are from them or lessons that I learned from them somehow, you know, and I think that's, I think that's really important. I think that's why, you know, improv is such an oral tradition because we sort of communicate those things that, that were communicated to us sometimes in the same way, sometimes in different ways, but I think that's kind of where it comes from, you know? Right. Um, I, I, I agree. Uh, when you, when you go, when you play, cause you're, you con- you consistently perform still, which, uh, which you had mentioned, when you are performing, uh, do you feel more pressure to perform? I don't know. I don't want to say better, but maybe, uh, at a higher level or as a teacher, when you see that there's students in the audience. Uh, well, I, I think I tried to, I think I, not pressure, but I think I try, I think I remember the basics more, you know, cause I'm a big believer in the basics. I think it always comes back to the basics. So, so I know that when there's students in the audience, I really, um, I'm really conscious of the basics. I really try to play, play the basics. I try to be a good example, you know, but, I'll, but by the same token, that, so that's going into the show. I think, Oh gosh, I really want to be a good example. I really want to show them that I'm not full of shit. And I really do it the way that I try to get them to do it, you know? Um, but then once the show gets rolling, it's kind of rolling, you know, and sort of whatever happens, happens, you know, right. but I guess I feel not, not pressure, but like a responsibility to, to show them like, yeah, this, I'm, I'm doing it just the way that we're talking about doing it in class. Um, in addition to teaching, do you coach still or, cause you started, you said you started out by coaching and then you got to teaching. So are you still coaching these days? Um, I coach here and there sometimes, you know, I, I sort of feel like, uh, I think I'm a, I think I'm a good coach 
for for like a short term, like a couple of few months. And then and then I get people to a place where they're doing it the way that I want them to do it, you know, and then and then just to go on coaching from there is 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 hard for me to it's hard for me to do. So I think I'm a good short term coach. Some people are great long term coaches and they coach a team for years or something, you know. Um, but that's never really been me. You know, because I, I coach them and I sort of get them to a certain place. I, I take them to where I think here's the next level and I can take them to that next level and then they go away, they get another coach, they learn some different things, and then sometimes they'll come back. I'm like, oh, great, okay, great. Here's a whole new set of, of, of thoughts because of where you guys are now, you know? And I think sort of like sort of like we do in classes, like it's inter- I love teaching level one and level three because I see students in level one, and then they go in a way and have like a level two experience, and then I see them sometimes level three again. I'm like, oh, great, I have a whole new set of things to teach you now because you have these other experiences, right? It was just one, it's sort of why we don't have just like, why you're not assigned one teacher for all six levels and sort of hear from one voice all the way through. I mean, I think that's really important to hear different, different takes on it. Cause then you sort of like, you know, you, you, you try different things, you stretch in different ways. You know, I think that's what, that's what I really appreciated about my experience in Chicago was having so many different teachers and so many different coaches and that kind of, and playing with different people. I think that's sort of, um, heterogeneity like really makes it um, really good. Like really, I think that's you know just like any sort of like pool where you want sort of like different kinds of genes and mixing together makes the thing stronger. I think the same thing. Different kinds of ideas and experiences mixing together makes your work and you as a player stronger. Okay, so I want to um, definitely run through some scenarios with you then. Um, the student who is just consistently resistant to taking notes or receiving the feedback, likes to push back, likes to challenge or defend. Right. Sometimes I, uh, I think that sometimes I think that like I'll notice that in class and I will address it, address it privately with them after class or in an email because I feel like sometimes people can't hear notes. Some some notes like that, it's about their personality or something. I feel like they can't hear that note in front of a group of people, you know, because they're not going to hear it. They're going to close off to protect their to protect themselves, which I get. I totally get that. Right. So I think that sometimes I have a better um, success rate if I talk to them after class or 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 in an email and just say, look, you know, I Usually it's people who have experience from a, some other school or from some, they've been doing improv for X amount of time or whatever. And I say to them, look, I, I appreciate that you have experience and I, I, and I can totally, you know, identify with that. When I started, when I came to the IO, I had been already improvising for six or seven years. And so um, I totally get it. And I was really frustrated at first because I felt like, oh my gosh, I have all these skills and but they're trying to teach me this other way. And I feel like I'm frustrated because I, I know what works for me. And, and, and I just try to communicate with them that I understand where they're coming from, but why not take the journey of this class? You're in this class, you came here, you paid your money, you're devoting your time, which is a precious resource. Why not just try it on for size for this class, for the next couple of weeks, just try, try to do what I'm asking you to do. And then, you know, when you're done with this class, you can tell me to fuck off and, and you can do whatever you're going to do. But but try it out. You may get something out of it. I said, but right now I feel like you're kind of trying to do what you've been doing, what you came into the class doing um, and not change and try to and try to just jam this square peg into a round hole. And and I think you have a lot of really great skills, but but why not take the journey? Take take the ride that we're on and see and see maybe you learn something. You know, worst case scenario, you know, you don't learn anything and in, in, in seven weeks you, you go on. But I that that never happens. I think you're gonna learn something if you open yourself up and, and just try. Try it on for size. I have some students like that right now. This you know they, they, they I think I think the hardest person to teach is someone who has some experience. Because I think that they they have a way that works for them, and they ha- they know how to get their laughs, and they sort of have come from a school where they were sort of I think in general usually rewarded for doing it X Y Z way, and so 
for them to sort of go back to being a truly being a student and to truly risking again, I think is scary because we come in as a student, we're risking everything, we're risking our ego, we're risking our, you know, whatever, whatever makes us us, we're risking looking dumb, we're risking failing. Um, and when we, when we don't have any experience, we're, I think that's easier sometimes because you're like, well, I, I've never done this before, so if I look dumb, I guess that's it, right? But then in your mind, if you have some experience, you come to it and you're like, if I look dumb, I've been doing this for seven years. I shouldn't, I shouldn't ever look dumb doing this again, right? So it's hard to risk. It's hard to try to do something a new way because you're risking. You're risking looking dumb or whatever. And, and, and that's why I think it's harder to teach people that have some experience because it, that's a tough pill to swallow, you know, risking again. But I think that, I think that if I can communicate to them my journey with this of like, I had all these skills, but I had to put, like when you, when you get a black belt, right, in some style of martial art, and then you move over over to another style, you need to sort of put that black belt aside for a minute. And you need to learn the basics and the sort of philosophies of that martial art. But then once you sort of get a certain, a certain sort of competency in that new martial art, all, all those other skills you had before come flooding back to you in a new way. And that's the kind of dynamic I try to, to, to tell people. Like when I came to IO, I had tons and tons of long form experience, but I had to put all that aside and learn the basics of, of, um, of, of long, sorry, I had tons of short form experience and I came and I had to put all that aside. And then I learned the basics of long form. And then a lot of those skills, a lot of those things I learned in short form came flooding back to me and were accessible to me in a new way in long form. But I couldn't try to do long form as short form. I couldn't try to build this thing with the skills that I already had. I had to get some new skills. And then once I got those new skills, then I said, oh, gosh, then I can access this in a, in a new way. So let's talk about the student who, um, you know, a lot of times we open the floodgates with this whole yes and, especially if they, especially if they are really new to it, and a bunch of things will come up on stage and in class and whatnot. Um, and so how do you handle when something maybe sexist or racist comes up or uh, or the student who is clearly using improv um to hit on other people, you know, and using the excuse of, well, I can yes, you have to yes and, so I'm going to throw this terrible thing out here on stage or try to touch you in an inappropriate way. A couple of different things. Like if someone says something that's sexist or racist or whatever, I mean, we at the IO especially have a kind of, you know, zero tolerance policy about that. Um, And so we definitely – Try to stop people from doing so, uh, that. But before the same we token, go on to that, so with the zero tolerance policy, how are they made aware of the zero tolerance policy prior to stepping into the classroom? Or is that on you as a teacher to let them know that? Um, we, we tell them first day, and they we tell them it's part of like our intro speech about the classes, and they get sort of a, a sheet of policies and stuff, and that's one of the one of the policies. Okay. okay. On there. So they've been pre they've been pre informed. Um, or they've been so informed, I guess. I don't know how you get pre-informed. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so they've been informed, but now you're dealing with it. So now, now. Yeah, so now they're in class and they're saying something or they're doing something that's like sexist or racist or whatever. So then I, the, 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 I, the, the trickiest part I think is that, is that you want to try to make the best, I as a teacher, try to make the best of what, Ever they're coming up with, right? So if they say something that's sexist, I try to I try to help them see that that that's not that's not a great that's not your best choice. You know what I'm saying? And also I try to inform them that it is offensive, and and you know we can do things that are sort of racy or sort of challenging for the audience, but I think that we do them with a certain a certain point of view and a certain sort of. Um, uh, uh, not forethought, but a certain sort of deeper meaning. And and the thing, the sort of the height of this example, I always sort of point to is all in the family, you know, where, you know, Archie Bunker was a sexist, racist, like homophobic, anti-Semitic. Like he pointed up all the flaws of that character. He was a terribly, terribly flawed character, but he was a great tool to show how flawed and outmoded and outdated and how ridiculous those ideas are, you know what I'm saying? So if, it, if, if it's a more advanced class, 
I might try to sort of tell them, like, what's your point of view about this? Are you saying that this is okay? Because if you're saying this is okay, that's not okay. If you're saying this is really crazy and absurd, then great. Then let's try to heighten that idea. Let's try to find a way to sort of make that commentary. You know, in level one, I think we sort of shy away from that sort of thing. I just try to, in general, sort of like push, you know, just like let's, you know, let's be sort of sensitive and aware of of, the, of those ideas. And, 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 you know, let's not sort of tread into that into that crazy territory. You know, as students get more adept in improv and they have more tools and skills and they have like a point of view that they're trying to get across. Then, then I think it becomes a little, a little trickier because you're like, okay, you want them to engage these ideas, but in a way that is like um, not fostering them and not sort of propagating them, but commenting on them maybe. Because I think commenting on them is okay, but I don't think that fostering them or sort of like condoning them is okay. You know what I'm saying? So it's like that's a very fine line, but I think that's a more advanced, advanced pop. In level one, uh, I just try to, I just try to basically sort of you know, tell people that, that, I, that they need to treat each other with respect and, uh, and sort of keep it more on the, more on the straight and narrow. And then later on, I think we sort of get, I, I sort of open the, I'm, I as a teacher am more open because in level one, we have bigger fish to fry than commentary and, and like these sort of high level concerns. We're just trying to survive two person scenes. You know what I'm saying? That's our basic thing. Then later on when the students are more advanced and they are, are, sort of really working on point of view and sort of these sort of more political ideas, then I as a teacher am more open to these um, to these arenas as possibilities for, for scenes. But again, we have to treat them with a lot of sensitivity, a lot of intelligence, a lot of insight for that scene to work. You know, if you're just like, well, I'm a racist. That's my character's a racist. Okay. And what do you and what are you as a player saying about that? You know what I'm saying? Like, what's your, what's your point of view on that? You know, you can't just come out and say, well, I'm a racist, so that's what I say. Well, no, that's not enough, you know? So I think, I think that's, really, that's really super tricky. I think that sort of the physical boundaries of people sort of hitting on each other or touching people on stage is, is again, also, I think super, super tricky, but in a, in a different way. I had a student who was very um, handsy or would always, whenever he's in a scene with a woman, he would always tell her to sit down, you know, just like these really sort of power plays. And so one day in class, we did an exercise and I was like, I, I don't think you know that you're doing this. And then I just want to alert you to this idea. And so whenever he touched his partner, I would say hands. And I must have said hands like 50 times in a scene. And he was like, wow. And he really just sort of like got the message. You know what I'm saying? We're much more sort of like 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago when I started improvising, we never really taught or taught, not taught, talked about like white privilege or male privilege. You know what I'm saying? But our society, luckily and happily, has moved forward and we sort of are more conscious of these of these issues. So I think we're just trying to... Um, you know, sort of deal with it on a, on a, and we have this general policy. We try to deal with it on a scene by scene basis. I try to, in class, let someone know what they're doing. And if they're, cause I think that sometimes in improv, it's like, you know, it's like truth serum or it's like sort of whatever, or you're, you're drunk a little bit on improv. You say these things like, Oh shit, I didn't mean to say that. Whatever. Like when one time my wife was at an improv audition and she, it was a husband and wife scene. And as soon as it started, this guy's like, shut up just shut up. And for the whole scene, just told her to shut up. And then afterwards he was like, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I said that or why I did that. And in general, I think that people are trying to do their best, you know? And so I try to let people know what they're doing and that this kind of, uh, this kind of content really isn't, isn't acceptable. And if it continues, you know, then, then that's a bigger problem. And then I sort of try to loop in the, you know, the, the, the office and the administration of IO and we sort of decide on how best to, how best to, to deal with it. But I know that I, as a teacher and I, as a player, am much more sensitive to it and sensitive about it now than, than when I started. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I just, our, I think our whole society is from sort of these issues have come, come to the fore. They've come out of the shadows in, into the light, you know? And that's, and that's part and parcel of a lot of things, of like sexual harassment, 
and, you know, between students or between teachers and students or whatever, you know, all this kind of stuff. The, the whole society is moving forward. So I think improv is just a little fraction or fragment of that. Um, but I try to, in general, I guess, sort of, I, like when I was in college, I was an RA and we had the principal in loco parentis, which is like, I am the, I'm the parent that's nearby. And so I think I try to just make sure that the, in the broadest sense, I try to make sure that the class is a safe place and a supportive place where people can stretch and try and risk and, and feel safe coming and like they're not going to be harassed by me or their fellow students or, or, you know, whatever. And, and I try to really try to be, uh, make myself available to students and, and, you know, on certain occasions, students have informed me of behavior that they're, that they're uncomfortable with. And I've tried to sort of, you know, take that into account and, and deal with it. So I have, I want to ask you one last question, sort of like a, a Paul Valencourt improv tip, if you will. So just like, you know, quick, like you can, you can like answer in that way is what does it mean to be a teacher in improv? I think sort of as a, as, as, as a teacher of improv, honestly, I'm just someone who's like a little bit further down the road and I have a lantern and I'm like saying, come on this way, come on this way. You know what I'm saying? Here's, here's some thoughts, here's some ideas, here's something that I'm, that I'm in love with that I want to show you more of. Come on down this road a little bit. That's kind of what I, that's kind of how I think of it because I don't certainly don't have it all figured out. You know what I'm saying? I have a few years in the, in, in the game and I, I love improv and I just want to share that love with other people, you know, and if someone's like interested in improv, I want them to love improv. A lot of my favorite students or are, 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 are students that I really feel for are students that come to level one. They're like, well, I did this other theater. I had a terrible experience and I didn't do improv for 10 years. And I'm like, you know what, you know, wounded bird, I'm going to fix those wings. You're going to fly again. Like, come on, we're going to work this out. Cause I, cause when someone that doesn't have a good experience in improv, I take it really personally. Even if, it's, even if it wasn't with me, if it was another class, another school, or 10 years ago, whatever, I'm like, no way. Improv is awesome. <laughs> I'm going to show you, you know. And so I just want to get, want to get them back into that place where they realize how great improv is. And, and that's, for me, that's, that's kind of what I'm always about. And that's what, you know, that's kind of what it means to me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and I hope, yes, thank you. And I hope everybody uh, has enjoyed listening. And um, we'll catch you soon. We'll tell everybody where to find you. Well, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and tell us where to find you? Um, you can find me on Facebook at Paul Valencourt. You can find me on YouTube at PV Improv. You can find me on Instagram uh, at What's Up with PV and on Twitter at What's Up with PV. Awesome. Great. Hopefully uh, everybody's got that. And if not, it will be in the comments, comments section of the podcast. So thank you so much.